Welcome to the beginning of the end of ESG. Please welcome the Honorable Paul Ray, Director of the Heritage Foundation's Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's really good to see you here. And uh, gentlemen, thank you all for being up here on the stage. This is just a tremendously exciting panel. Um, we're here to talk about recent developments in ESG investing. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And the basic idea is using investments to pursue environmental and social change. So we're here to talk about, talk about that today. Now, some of you know, Americans have used their investment dollars uh, for centuries to invest according to their values. And we here at the Heritage Foundation, we warmly support that. But there have been a couple of concerning trends in recent years, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So one of those trends is uh, investment managers making decisions to pursue environmental and social change, uh, not at the direction of their clients. And that really raises some serious concerns about a breakdown of the principal-agent relationship. Um, you could have people, including retirees, who have their financial security endangered so their investment managers can pursue their environmental and social priorities that the, um, the clients may not actually agree with. Um, and the other concerning trend that we see is we see a, a federal thumb on the scale in favor of ESG investing. So we've seen that in a number of proposed rulemakings coming from federal agencies in the last year, 18 months. Uh, one in particular uh, was issued just a couple of months ago that's a really important Securities and Exchange Commission uh, regulation uh, about uh, the disclosure of ESG information. Basically, the regulation would require public companies as a condition of accessing the public markets to um, disclose their GHG emissions uh, information about their climate response plans, and indeed how often their uh, corporate boards talk about climate-related risk in the privacy of their own boardrooms. It's a, it's a remarkable rule, remarkable in a bad way. Uh, and uh, so heritage scholars weighed in on that rule. We had a bunch of comments filed from a number of scholars here from all across the enterprise. And that's, a, that's an area that heritage is going to be um, much more engaged in going forward, is commenting on federal regulations because we see a tremendous need there as long as the federal executive has the kind of power that it has today to pursue uh, regulations of, of this magnitude. We see a really important role for conservatives uh, here in Washington and across the country to provide the legal and policy analysis necessary to, to push back on these, uh, on these rulemakings. Um, so just really excited for the, for the panel today. I want to thank, again, thank you all for, for being here um, with me. So uh, I'll, without, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, the, the panel today. So uh, to my left is the Honorable Riley Moore, Treasurer of the State of West Virginia. Uh, Treasurer Moore has been a leading voice in state pushback on ESG, on runaway ESG uh, initiatives from investment managers and federal authorities. Uh, to his left is the Honorable Andy Barr, U.S. Representative from Kentucky, from the Lexington area. Uh, Representative Barr recently introduced an important bill on ESG investing, which is H.R. 7151, require investment managers to look just to financial risks and returns when they're making investments, unless their clients specifically direct them otherwise. Uh, and then to his left is uh, Will Hill, the Executive Director of Consumers Research, uh, which is a main voice advocating for the needs of consumers and investors with regard to ESG issues. So uh, without Further ado, let's uh, let's jump right in. So, uh, Treasurer Moore, could you please tell us about how ESG impacts states and and how the states are reacting? Sure. No, and thank you for having me. Um, certainly, this is affecting every state because it's making the cost of energy more expensive. Um, state of West Virginia. I'll give you an example. Of what we're dealing with, we have financial institutions. Um, I'll start with the first category of which are banks that have come up with policy frameworks where they have laid out in very clear terms that they will no longer lend money to certain uh, actors within the fossil fuel industry, uh, specifically coal, oil, and gas. The uh, latter two, they have put in place many times enhanced due diligence where they'll have to diversify their portfolio into green energy and then a gas company then doesn't become a gas company any longer. And so for us in West Virginia, 
we uh, generate hundreds of millions of dollars from severance tax. Those are dollars generated from the extraction of coal and gas and oil. Uh, it's critical to our economy, uh, not only for the tax revenue, but also the jobs that it provides. Um, so for us to continue to do business with financial institutions that are boycotting our industries, we felt like we have a clear conflict of interest there. And we're meeting that conflict of uh, interest um, with legislation. And that conflict of interest has really uh, made us feel that we have a compelling interest uh, to address this because the detrimental effect it could have on our economy and our jobs uh, and, frankly, our way of life in West Virginia. And it would affect every other state if they were able to get what they wanted. So I had coal operators and gas companies come to me and say, look, we're not able to continue to have access to financing for our operations. Is there anything you can do? And um, so we started to push back against this. I started a 15-state coalition a letter that I led that said we're going to reform our banking contracts moving forward and where you're going to have to certify you're not boycotting the fossil fuel industry. Every state treasurer's office is uniquely different in the authorities that govern them. Uh, West Virginia, I have a lot more latitude than perhaps some of the other states. And then on top of that, we introduced a bill in West Virginia uh, that passed. It's been signed into law. Uh, it actually just became effective where I'm going to put companies that are boycotting the fossil fuel industry, uh, financial uh, companies that are boycotting the fossil fuel industry, on a denied financial uh, institution list where they will be barred from all contracts with the state of West Virginia moving forward. Uh, unless they decide to change their tune. And we just sent letters out to six different financial institutions here about a couple weeks ago. And we're, they have a 30-day appeal period, so we're waiting to hear back from them. I've heard from a few of them so far. Um, and we'll go through that process, but they will be barred in perpetuity unless they decide to change their terms and their approach of what they're doing, um, and which I do hope they do. But for us, I mean, this is really an existential threat I view ESG as probably in the nicest terms, it's coercive capitalism, but really I think this is economic extortion that's going on here uh, at the behest of left-wing and woke political ideology uh, that is going to affect every individual in this country because the end of the day, um, renewable energies, wind and solar, I, I mean, it's supplemental energy. The world consumes wind and solar 3% is the electricity they provide in the world. So really should they only be, they really should only be, I think, 3% of the conversation where we're talking about electrification requirements, not only in this country, but around the world. So for us, we're looking forward to that list coming out. We're going to see what happens. And then at the beginning of January, I dropped BlackRock from the Board of Treasury Investments inside the West Virginia Treasury. We no longer do business with BlackRock, so we are done with them. And um, obviously that made some waves, and we're going to continue to make some waves here in the state. But I will say my bill has passed in Kentucky. It has passed in Tennessee. It's passed in Oklahoma. Texas has their own version of the bill. The bill ran in 13 different states. And I think you're going to see it run in close to 20 states around the country here in the next legislative sessions. Well, as a proud Tennessean, I was thrilled to see uh, the bill go forward in my state. So yeah. thank, thank you for your, for your work. You it's trem it's trem <laughs> tremendous. Well, th thank you. Uh, Representative Barr, um, you know, one uh, reason that I'm so excited about this panel this morning is really we see the leading advocates on pushback to ESG from the uh, state, federal, and, and private sectors all coming together. So it's just a tremendous opportunity so, uh, to, to hear what everyone is doing from, from you know, really sort of around the, the whole conservative ecosystem. So Representative Barr, I wanted to turn to you now and ask about uh, federal efforts and in particular about your, about your new bill, which I think uh, appeared on the House floor just very recently, right, in the last, last couple of weeks. Uh, yes, and thank you so much to Heritage Foundation for the invitation to be with you, and it's great to be with uh, these uh, terrific uh, co-panelists, uh, and uh, I really applaud the work of uh, Treasurer Moore in West Virginia, who has worked with uh, my treasurer in Kentucky, Allison Ball, in this effort uh, by the states, asserting themselves uh, on behalf of uh, the retirees in their public pension programs uh, and their uh, investments uh, to push back against ESG. Um, we saw ESG, uh, you know, develop over time uh, in the private sector, uh, and we saw 
uh, banks uh, choking off capital to fossil energy or other politically unfashionable uh, businesses, um, not as much as a response to, to market forces as kind of artificial stakeholder capitalism, meaning non-investor pressure, uh, non-owners, non-shareholder uh, stakeholders pressuring uh, these uh, public companies uh, to divest of certain politically incorrect businesses, uh, not just fossil energy, by the way, firearms, uh, payday lenders, other uh, other uh, businesses that they deemed uh, uh, not uh, in the uh, politically correct category. Um, we saw that it, it migrate over into uh, large woke asset managers. Certainly the European financial system and so some sovereign wealth funds uh, push this. But compounding that problem of stakeholder capitalism and the embrace of some uh, on Wall Street and in the business uh, leadership community embracing uh, the politicization of allocation of capital, um, we now see a whole of government approach at the federal level in the Biden administration to codify some of these practices in violation of uh, uh, officer and director's fiduciary obligations to their shareholders and obligations that asset managers have uh, to their investors. Uh, the, the, and we see this most prominently in the bank regulation uh, in the Fed through these, the creation of these climate, international climate uh, supervision committees. And then at the Securities and Exchange Commission, where you've seen uh, an effort by Chairman Gensler to transform that agency from uh, an independent regulatory agency dedicated to investor protection into a uh, politicized bureaucracy uh, that is trying to force uh, the, the, um, the, the, the redirection of capital in ways that the market naturally would not accommodate. Uh, so uh, we see now the, federal, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, promulgating a 534-page monstrosity uh, that requires public companies to disclose uh, not only uh, their, the emissions arising from their own operations, uh, but the emissions arising from the, the producers of energy that they consume, and then what's called scope three emissions, emissions that they have to calculate from their customers and their suppliers. Uh, this is a, an incredibly burdensome requirement on public companies. It's a diversion of resources away from w what their, their core business typically would be. Uh, it also is a transparent effort to redirect capital away from fossil energy in ways that will exacerbate this inflation crisis, uh, dry up financing for American energy companies. And then the final point I would make, uh, uh, framing the problem, is that the SEC proposal would actually do the opposite of the core mission of the SEC, which is to protect investors. Uh, <clears throat> what what investors need is material information, disclosures that are material uh, to the financial performance of the, the companies, the public companies that they're investing in. What this uh, proposal would do would be to inundate shareholders with voluminous, voluminous amounts of immaterial and unreliable information about emissions and other issues that, frankly, most retail investors don't care about. Most retail investors, when you just survey, anecdotally, survey uh, investment advisors in West Virginia or Kentucky or Florida or wherever, most, uh, most retail investors are not the sustainable ESG investors that you hear about. Of course, investors should have the ability, as you pointed out, to direct their capital, deploy their capital in ways that are consistent with their values. It's their money. It's their property, after all. Uh, but most, the default should always be to maximize shareholder value, to maximize returns for the investor. And most uh, middle class savers in this con uh, country depend on the performance, the financial performance of their 401k, their IRA, their 529 saving for college. Uh, and this uh, disclosure regulation would not only uh, subordinate returns to political factors, uh, but it would expose these public companies to massive am amounts of litigation. Uh, that will affect uh, 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 company performance and fund performance. The other uh, dimension of this is fees. Uh, why is BlackRock doing this? Why is Vanguard doing this, State Street, Invesco? The reason why these large asset managers are doing this is it's, it's actually quite profitable. ESG funds, the fees 
are 43% on average, 43% higher uh, than non-ESG funds. Uh, and that eats into returns uh, for these investors. And uh, they don't uh, uh, perform better. There's, there's, you can pick the data, you can cherry pick the data, but in this recent sell-off, you'll see that a lot of these ESG funds were tech heavy. Tech has experienced a huge sell-off recently. Energy prices are up, so, so energy prices are performing well. Uh, ESG uh, funds are typically not performing uh, as, as well. So um, there's lots of problems with this, and on the materiality front, it was Justice Thurgood Marshall who wrote the seminal decision in TSE Industries versus Northway uh, that said that um, on, on materiality and uh, inundating shareholders with a voluminous amount of irrelevant information uh, is not conducive to, to sound decision making for investors. And that's what this uh, SEC disclosure rule would do. Uh, it would provide investors with immaterial information. It would uh, result in uh, inferior uh, performance uh, and, and lower returns. And, and that is not protecting investors. So we've come up with a solution, and I'll, I'll close here. We've come up with a solution and a, and a response, a legislative response to the SEC's rulemaking. And we call it the ESG Act, but it's not environmental and social governance. It's ensuring sound guidance. <laughs> we believe that asset managers, investment advisors, ERISA plan sponsors uh, should act in the best financial interest uh, of the investor. And so what we, we simply do is we amend the Investor Advisors Act for uh, investment advisors um, who manage non-retirement savings uh, funds. And then we amend the ERISA uh, statute because most of the, this is in the retirement savings space. And we require the asset managers in both of those cases in the retirement and non-retirement categories uh, to prioritize the financial returns over and above non-pecuniary factors like ESG. Um, and uh, we think that would recalibrate the duties and, and confirm uh, the duties of uh, investment advisors so that they prioritize shareholders and investors above these uh, political factors. The politicization of, the, of capital allocation in this country, I think, is a, a very problematic development because it, it, it is the politicization of ca capitalism uh, and it is the corruption of capitalism, and uh, we need to stand up against it. Well, thank you, Representative Barr. You know, when I first became familiar with investment managers uh, <clears throat> using uh, client funds to pursue environmental or social goals of the managers and not the clients, I, I said to myself, there ought to be a law against this. And, and lo and behold, now there's a, there's a chance to be a law against this. So that's, that's tremendous. Um, thank you for, for filling us in on that. Um, Mr. Hill, I'd love to, to turn to you now. Now, uh, Consumers Research has just done tremendous work um, over the last few months about um, reaching out to ordinary Americans to explain what exactly ESG investing is and what the effect uh, could be on, on them and their retirement and financial security. And so I, I'd be very curious to hear, one, how, how you guys you know, explain this kind of, this term that I think a lot of folks have not uh, encountered uh, in the past, and then uh, um, the kind of reactions that, that folks have when you, when you explain what's, what's going on. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we launched something called the Consumers First Initiative uh, about this time last year uh, to do two things. One, to educate consumers on the ways in which their interests were being betrayed by people going woke, corporations going woke, in order to distract from those corporations' misdeeds and mistreatments of their customers. We started with some names that you've probably all heard of, Coca-Cola, Nike, American Airlines, Ticketmaster, MLB. But in October of last year, we wanted to launch a, a campaign, start a campaign against BlackRock and Larry Fink because it's a company that our polling told us almost no one knew about and even fewer people could actually name what they did. But they're one of the most powerful companies on earth. They control $10 trillion of assets under management. Again, that's not their money. As we've noted here, it's you know local pensions, state pensions, uh, federal pensions are managed by uh, BlackRock mostly. Um, and as you've noted, uh, Paul, they are open about the fact that they inject their personal politics in the way they manage those assets. They brag about it. And the average consumer 
is being betrayed in, in two ways. Uh, first, as, as Treasurer Moore and, and uh, Congressman Barr have noted, uh, it is a betrayal of the fiduciary, it's a breach of the fiduciary duty that Larry Fink and BlackRock owe and others like Vanguard and State Street owe to their clients, some of which are private clients, some of which are public. Uh, it's even worse, you're using public money to, to inject politics into, into capitalism. Um, but they're also uh, betraying the consumers that all of these companies are supposed to be serving. So they are lowering the returns uh, and, and injecting politics into capitalism at the same time that they are raising the price of goods and services, they are lowering the quality because they're taking the attention of corporate America off of serving their customers, which ultimately is, is the true purpose of, of capitalism. That's why we created the corporate structure here in the United States. It wasn't, investor returns are obviously a, a focus because that's, we, and that's how we incentivize people to go out into the market, create new goods and services, lower the prices, increase the quality. But the ultimate aim, the reason we do that, provide that incentive, is to provide for the consumer. And what Larry Fink and, and BlackRock and, and other companies that are engaging in this kind of nonsense are doing is actually taking that away, taking that focus away. We think it is illegal. We think it should be. We uh, laud uh, Congressman Barr's uh, legislation for making it even more illegal, so make it easier to go after these folks uh, who are who are betraying these interests. And we, we think more consumers need to know. Uh, even if they have all their money in crypto and Beanie Babies, uh, it is hurting them at the gas pump. It is hurting them when they get their power bill. And it's even going to start hurting. It's hurting them at the grocery stores. A lot of people don't realize it's not just energy that these companies are going after. They are going after uh, you know, the, the cattle industry. They are going after um, all extractive technologies. In some ways, it's self-defeating because they're even making it harder. You know, the Biden administration right now is all about all the green energies, the things that you mentioned. Those all require rare earth minerals, lithium for batteries, cobalt, uh, some of which we do have here in the United States. And yet, they are making it harder with ESG investing to actually do extractive technologies because those get penalized to the benefit, as, as Congressman Barr noted, of you know, tech-heavy uh, uh, companies that just have a bunch of people in an office. So they you know, score better on their ESG. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Holden. I, I love the point that you made about um, the uh, companies being distracted from what they're already doing. You know, I, I think a lot of folks have the perspective that um, ESG is important because we want to pursue a noble goal in whatever we do, right? I think what people can forget is that the, the work that companies are already doing is it, it can itself be a tremendously noble goal, right? Um, creating energy that's needed to run hospitals and homes and keep people warm in the winter, uh, growing food, uh, you know, creating baby formula, something that we've seen, obviously, a scarcity of in, in, in recent months and, and been reminded is just tremendously important, the, uh, the, the day-in, day-out work of, of ordinary Americans to create the goods and services that, that Americans need to, to stay alive and thrive is just already tremendously important, and it's not necessary to necessarily to pursue uh, other kind of uh, investment goals to be a part of, of important enterprises like that. So I, I'm really glad you brought out that point. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Congressman Barr, I'd like to follow up on something that you said, if that's, if that's all right. Um, you, you mentioned scope three. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, not many folks, I think, have heard about ESG investing. I'm going to guess even fewer have heard about scope three. I, I had to look up what that meant um, at, the, at the beginning of of this uh, ESG saga. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, Scope 3, what the SEC rule will require around Scope 3, and, and the potential impact on small business? Sure. And we're very laser focused on this in the House Financial Services Committee. We have oversight jurisdiction over the SEC's rulemaking. And like I said before, this is, this is taking the SEC beyond its core authority and jurisdiction, certainly, it contradicts, in fact, its mission of investor protection and capital formation. But then on, uh, beyond that, uh, we, maybe, maybe ESG has, uh, <laughs> has knocked out our power. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Larry Fink listening in. That was a blackout, folks, as a result of uh, BlackRock. No. Uh, no, let me just, uh, no, w the SEC is compromised. So the core mission of the SEC is uh, investor protection. Uh, it is cap to facilitate capital formation and uh, uh, orderly, fair, uh, efficient markets. Ironically, this rulemaking uh, that encapsulates scope one emissions, scope two emissions, and scope three emissions uh, conflicts with all three of those missions. Uh, we talked about how it compromises in, uh, investor protection because it would result in uh, uh, substandard returns and less diversified portfolios. Investing 101 is about diversification. 
uh, this, th this would mandate less diversified portfolios. Um, and it would exclude uh, energy uh, uh, companies. Uh, the other thing it would do is it would uh, destroy capital formation because it would redirect capital away from certain key sectors of our economy. And then it certainly wouldn't create efficient markets because it would distort markets. Um, a scope one emission that they're referring to in the rulemaking is the emissions arising from the company's own operations, the public company's own operations. Scope two emissions are emissions that the company consumes, uh, the, the, the emissions from the producer of the, uh, of the energy that they consume. And then scope three emissions is this incredibly burdensome requirement that a public company would have to calculate the emissions of all of their customers and all of the, their suppliers up and down the supply chain. Uh, and if they don't accurately do so in the eyes of Washington regulators, they're subject to litigation. Uh, so you can imagine the alarm that this is creating in public, in public markets uh, and across the country and the burdens that it, it would create. One final point about the inflation crisis, the gas price prices at the pump. Uh, you know, and Treasurer Moore, I think, is doing a good job about this. The, the, uh, the, the energy sector requires, it is a capital intensive industry. It requires a, a considerable amount of financing for exploration, production, drilling, uh, and, and all the rest, and mining. Uh, the idea that we are going to, through the ESG movement and through this SEC disclosure res regime, discriminate against these companies and deprive them of financing is where this war on domestic energy production is uh, at its core. It's, that's the ground zero. You, you hear about canceling Keystone XL pipeline, denying permits, and uh, canceling lease sales. All of that is part of the Biden administration's whole of government a war on fossil energy that he announced in this campaign, very, very transparently. But ground zero is, is its uh, climate finance agenda and the weaponization of financial regulation to block capital flows to American energy company, all, all companies. All the while, uh, the Biden administration is begging OPEC, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, our enemies, to produce more energy. Uh, the Biden administration seems intent to discriminate against domestic energy production. And as I said before, the core part of that strategy is the, is the politicization of financial regulation. Well, thank you, Congressman Barr. I, <clears throat> this is just a tremendously important point that you just made that, you know, a, a lot of folks, when they encounter this SEC rule that we're talking about, they think it only applies to the largest companies, the companies that access the U.S. capital markets. Uh, and and that's just that's just not true because of the scope three disclosure requirement. Really, um, a lot of small businesses that buy from large companies and sell to large companies will also be affected. So that's just a, a tremendously important point. So thanks for thanks for drawing that out. I, I appreciate that. Now, Treasurer Moore, I'd, I'd like to to um, come back to something that you mentioned, if that's all right. Sure. Um, you referred to to a conflict of interest, that, that you perceive that, there, that West Virginia would have a, a conflict of interest if it, if it didn't enact the, or take the kind of steps that, that you guys took. You know, I think some conservatives, when they encounter the, the dispute about ESG, they get a little nervous seeing um, state, uh, state governments kind of taking a stand against certain investment strategies because they think, well, shouldn't, shouldn't investment advisors be left to to you know, kind of, kind of do what they want. We 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 support the private sector. We don't like uh, government overreach as conservatives. So um, I would really love to hear your your perspective on you know why um, the the measures that you guys took are are um, kind of flow out of this this need to to avoid conflict of interest and, and are just very um, very consistent with conservative principles and values. Yeah, you know, I get that question a lot, and <clears throat> one of the things to keep in mind as a state treasurer, uh, as a state treasurer, I am not a regulator, so I am not a regulator at all. There's no state treasurer that is a regulator. Uh, what I am is a market participant on behalf of my constituents and the taxpayers of West Virginia. So what I am doing is stating my preferences in the marketplace on behalf of my taxpayers and who we would like to do business with. Now, if um, you know some of the biggest banks out there don't align with what we've essentially put into a uh, provisoed contract, um, then they don't need to contract with us. But we're stating our preferences clearly in the marketplace, and I think this is actually a free market solution. The end of the day, all we want is the free market to remain free here. 
because what we, as Congressman Barr has pointed out very clearly, as as well, uh, what we have here is a distortion in the marketplace. We are not the distortion. They are the distortion very clearly. And so it's in in that conflict of interest, we have a compelling interest as well to do business with financial institutions that are conflict-free as it relates to trying to diminish the funds in which they are going to also manage at the exact same time. So that's why we have those uh, requirements that we'd like to see um, in our contracts, which we have now in our contracts moving forward, where they're conflict-free, where they're not going to try to diminish the same funds as they're managing them. Like, in short, we're not going to pay them to destroy us. <laughs> right. No, thank you, Treasurer. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, would, would it be fair to say that, um, that really West Virginia is, is just doing the precise, um, precise same value-driven investment that, that we said that, you know, that every American can do? You're investing according to your values with your money. Yes. Right? Yeah, and, and so investment managers shouldn't get to make the decision about uh, what values your, your money is used to produce. You, as the, as the client, the owner of that money, you should make that decision. Right, and we're just stating who we'd like to contract with. And you've got to flash back to where this all started. It was around this socially responsible investing, right? And that was an individual having agency over where they wanted to invest based on what uh, their values were, right? Now uh, we have these uh, large asset managers and also the federal government telling us where we need to be invested. And that's why uh, we view this as, uh, certainly my office, this coercive capitalism where it's, no, this is the way, and we're going to shut down all the other options that are out there because this is the only way that you can invest that's going to help the planet and help all of our social goals that we have in diversity and in equity and inclusion and all these other uh, three-letter acronyms that are out there that are very important to them rather than the very simple concept of human flourishing, which is directly tied to access to energy and freedom of choice out there in the marketplace. Uh, that's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Treasurer. Now, Mr. Hill, I'd, I'd like to uh, turn back to you. And, um, you know, one, one question that I would be very interested to hear about is when you explain to, um, to ordinary working Americans what ESG is and, uh, and, and, and the threat that runaway ESG can pose, uh, and they say, well, what, what can I do to, to push back? What do, what do you tell them? Certainly. Well, uh, it's, it's multi-pronged. So uh, obviously, if they have any of their own money in any of these funds, and I should note, you can have money with BlackRock without having a BlackRock account. They're, for example, the, the, the iShares brand ETFs are all, those are the BlackRock brands. So anyone listening to this should take a look and make sure that uh, none of their money is in those, those funds. And if they are, move them to a, to a fund that's not going to abuse, uh, abuse them and, and uh, them as a consumer or as an investor. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I think we have a perfect representation here of the multi-layer strategy that's going to take to push back on this. At the state level, so much of these funds are state funds that are being misused against their interests, local and state pension funds. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, a issue that the average person he hears a lot about that's kind of been cooked up in, in the back rooms of Wall Street. And so, you know, not every state official understands that this is something that the average person cares about. And so just communicating to your treasurer, uh, to your congressman, uh, to your governors and your AGs that, hey, I'm watching this. I know what Larry Fink and BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street are up to, and I expect you to do something about it. Many, especially at the state level, uh, a lot of state officials already have uh, uh, areas where they can uh, make a difference. For example, AGs in a lot of states, there's something called the sole purpose fiduciary rule already on the books, meaning that their state's pension fund has to be managed. All the assets have to be managed only for the maximization of benefits to the, to the the pensioners. And anything you put, like if you say, Larry Fink's out there saying, you know, I'm maximizing returns and Everything after the and is illegal, and he has said that over and over and over and over again. He is on record. BlackRock is on record, record uh, in, in official documents that they have put out um, that they are violating the sole purpose fiduciary rule. So, you know, contacting your governor's office, contact your AGs, um, letting them know this is an issue you care about and you want it to be a priority is huge. But then also, uh, and we saw, uh, you know, we just had a campaign against State Farm for, for another issue, um, and it was incredible 
how quickly that company shifted when they heard from their own customers. And so just calling these companies and telling them, if you're, if you're doing this, I'm gone. I, I expect different, and just uh, you know, blowing up their phone lines, it makes a bigger difference than you would think. Just when they, you know, the executive comes in and he's got you know, a bunch of messages from all of his underlings saying, we're getting calls everywhere just saying, cut it out, stop it. Um, and already we've seen Larry Fink is, is, is backpedaling. Uh, I need to buy him a unicycle to help with all the backpedaling he's doing uh, uh, lately because you know, I think he realizes how far outside of the bounds of capitalism and the law uh, him and BlackRock have gotten. And you know, that's in no small part by consumers pushing back and, and, and contacting their, their reps. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists. We're about out of time. So um, last, uh, last minute or so, any, uh, any final thoughts from anyone up here? Yeah, I'd just say one thing. There's one aspect of this that uh, we didn't touch on, and that is rating agencies. That's something that's going on right now at the state level. S&P Global right now has come out with ESG scores for all states and municipalities. And uh, obviously, West Virginia didn't great, get, get a great ESG score, our finances could not be better in the state of West Virginia currently, and we are likely going to uh, potentially see a downgrade on our credit score, which then is going to affect our ability um, to finance projects such as roads and schools and hospitals. This is why I use this term economic extortion. So it's, if we don't come into compliance with them, we will uh, pay the price as it relates literally the price uh, in bonding out our projects here in the future. And I think the real question is, how long is it till we have ESG scores for individuals, which I don't think is too far down the road, where you had a uh, gentleman of the economic, uh, World Economic Forum here just recently saying, we could track every individual's carbon footprint in the future. Uh, I, I do think that's something that if we don't continue to fight against this and the great work that Congressman Barr is doing and will, if we, and all the state treasurers out there that are fighting, if we don't continue to push against this, that's the world that we're going to live in. Thank you, Treasurer. And Treasurer Moore, thanks for the great work that you're doing on that. We will be watching um, the politicization of, of rating agencies as well. But also, when you talk about the, the principal agent uh, uh, problem that you see in ESG, the ESG movement, it's also with the, with the proxy advisory firms. So ISS and Glass-Lewis are also... Uh, uh, advising uh, the Black Rocks of the world, the uh, asset managers, to allocate capital in a politically directed way as opposed to a, a, a financially uh, driven way uh, and giving cover uh, to these asset managers and, and doing so without the real actual consent of the retail investor who is most interested in maximizing financial returns. Final point I want to make is the sad irony of this whole discussion about ESG is that the, the, the people who really care about climate or the climate crisis, uh, they're actually cutting off their nose despite their face. Uh, the, the greatest innovation that's happening in carbon capture, carbon sequestration, harnessing the carbon cycle, and addressing emissions is actually happening in the private sector, and the best scientists and innovators on this topic are in a lot of times, fossil energy companies. So ironically, by starving these American energy companies of capital, they're, they're actually depriving them of the financing that they need to innovate in ways that would actually solve the problem. Uh, so a lot of unintended consequences uh, in this whole discussion. And uh, we need to let capitalism work the way it, it's supposed to and directed by the market, not by political forces. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Hill. Well, following on from that point, it's an excellent point. Um, I, I would just, I think, note that uh, I think it's unfair to even call ESG an investment strategy because there's very little investment going on. It's really a disinvestment strategy. Uh, a tiny, tiny percentage of the trillions of dollars that are under, quote unquote, ESG management are actually going in to create new businesses, invest in R&D for new technologies. What it's almost exclusively done is to go and punish industries and choke off capital formation from, from disfavored from industries. And so this is nothing new is going to come out of ESG. You're not going to see cold fusion. You're not going to see a solution to carbon sequestration. Uh, all they're doing is going in and wagging their finger and yelling at corporations they don't like. And I think what we are increasingly seeing as well is that as uh, gas prices are up and, and these companies need to backpedal from their uh, overinvestment in tech, 
what they're going to start to see is probably trying to leverage, force corporate America, okay, we'll give you a little bit of a, of a pass on some of this E, some of the climate stuff, but we're going to need to see more S. So you're going to see more woke signaling. You're going to see more nonsense going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the in the boardrooms and and with the DEI uh, stuff that this, you know, pushing CRT and, and other stuff. We saw it with again with our State Farm campaign, just pushing you know obscene stuff with children. Um, and so that's something that consumers should be on the lookout for as as the as, as the good work that the treasurer and the congressman are doing. They're going, oh gosh, they're onto us. We got to move. I, I think you're probably going to start to see a shift where they're pushing this this weird S stuff a lot more, social stuff a lot more, and we need to be on that as well, because that's also a, a, uh, a hijacking of our capitalist process, and it takes the focus away from consumers. Great. Thank you, Will. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, great to see you all, and uh, certainly tune in uh, for the next panel uh, coming to you sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs>